Hello and welcome to Dorset. I'm Dr. Peter O'Kane. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the Royal Bournemouth Hospital, appointed almost 12 years to the very day. Uh, you can see my Twitter handle for anyone interested in uh, comments after this webinar. Today I'm going to be talking about stent failure, going through mechanistic features, treatment strategies, and going through a case-based approach to illustrate these points. Um, this production is kindly put on by uh, Radcliffe Cardiology, who have been uh, providing educational events for some time. And this webinar is sponsored by Philips. There will be a presentation that I'm about to do, followed by question and answers at the end for any of those uh, people who are interested in interacting. So the objectives are fairly simple. There's four. First of all, we'll talk about the interacting factors that lead to stent failure, then talk about physiological assessment rather than angiographic, go through intracoronary imaging, and then talk about lesion preparation for optimal durability in the long term. So talking about the factors, first of all, that lead to stent failure. First of all, the definition. Roxana Moran defined in stent restenosis back in 1996 as a 50% reduction in the luminal area within a stent or the native vessel. It also includes in-segment restenosis, five millimeters proximal or distal to the edge of the stent. It's associated with a clinical definition as well, i.e. symptoms, positive physiology, positive reduction in the MLA with uh, either angiographic, more than 70% stenosis, or indeed uh, luminal area less than four or six, depending on uh, the proximity of the vessels using uh, uh, intravascular imaging. Now, originally described in bare metal stents, it also now applies to uh, drug eluting stents has been uh, verified in, in a study in 2008. So that's the definition of instant restenosis, but how does it uh, come about? Now, when we put a stent in, we hope for this type of result, a nice cylindrical uh, stent, which is uh, optimally applied to the vessel wall. And with our first generation stents, we sometimes found that they didn't heal so well, which did lead in some cases to stent thrombosis, this uncovered strut phenomenon. But with contemporary stents, we get this type of appearance, a nice thin layer of tissue inside the stent on the luminal surface, coating and protecting the metal against the blood so we don't end up with stent thrombosis, but also not encroaching too much on the lumen. Of course, coronary disease is a progressive disorder, and in some cases, neoatherosclerosis can develop, even of course within drug eluting stents, and plaque rupture of course then can occur. In some instances, we get very aggressive tissue within the stent, leading to uh, stent restenosis, the topic of today, and of course, in very rare situations, particularly in the first generation stents, we saw late acquired malapposition due to positive remodeling of the vessel, perhaps due to polymer interactions, which also led to problems. And importantly, we need to differentiate the timing. We know that bare metal stent occurs early in terms of restenosis, whereas drug eluting stent tends to occur after about two years. So there are many factors involved, and I think each patient is different when it comes to these factors. First of all, there's pharmacological related factors. Some patients have allergy or are intolerant of these drugs such as aspirin, clopidogrel, ticagrelor, or have inherent resistance. They may be hypersensitive to the drug on the stent, they may be hypersensitive to the polymer, and in some cases to the metal itself, i.e. nickel. There are biological factors that are present, which we don't measure, but more importantly, the bottom two ones that are coming up now, mechanical related and lesion related, I think are the things that we can influence in the cath lab making sure our stents are well opposed, making sure they're properly expanded, avoiding edge trauma, avoiding geographical miss, but being also wary of the lesions we're taking on. And of course, the patients in the center of this with diabetic, older age and female patients being more at risk. So of course it is, the lesion really is quite responsible. Type B, long lesions, calcification, bifurcations, they're all part of this pyramid that you see. And as we treat older and older patients, these are more and more common. So we have to be having awareness of this and also having the tools to try and deal with the difficult lesions. So preparation with scoring balloons for calcified lesions and bifurcations, the use of atherectomy devices such as laser, the use of rotation atherectomy, the use of now the intravascular lithoplasty, the shockwave is very interesting for calcium, all complemented with pressure wire and intracoronary imaging. I think all helps to avoid stent failure in the future. We know, in fact, of course, that calcium is the biggest hazard that we deal with. It's responsible for undilatable lesions. It can be a problematic peri-procedure in terms of wire or vessel perforation. 
We know that when we try to deliver a stent through calcification, we might damage the stent and the polymer and drug may also be damaged. We don't even see that. So we can't expect it to behave normally. And then under expansion is the worst case scenario, which can happen as well. When you look at restenosis up and down the UK, the instance is around 5% on average. There's clearly variation from centre to centre. You can see coming up highlighted is Bournemouth. We do see a lot of uh, restenosis up to 10%, but it's probably because we treat a lot of elderly patients. So should we guide with angiographic or physiological assessment? Well, we know that the discordance for de novo disease is about 30% for angiographic versus physiologically significant lesions. And really the same applies for restenosis. So we should be thinking about using FFR and IFR in this situation. Now, what you see below is that there's some clever technology now with our IFR, for instance, which allows us to use angiographic co-registration to help really define where lesion severity is and what we should be treating. I'm gonna start illustrating this with a case of an 80 year old gentleman who had previously treated uh, in 2015 with rotational atherectomy to the LAD, represented with angina in 2018, and you can see that has PCI to the uh, LAD, that's the final result in 2018, June, pressure wide guided, not great, but optimal, optimal at the time. Uh, but he comes back with further symptoms in December 2018. Um, what we found is that the, as predicted, the LAD has re-narrowed at the point where we last treated with drug-coated balloon uh, six months ago. Um, and it's a hazy appearance as it was before. In fact, if anything, it looks a bit more severe angiographically. The last time we treated this, we used pressure wire to guide the intervention, and we're going to do the same thing here, just to get a baseline uh, understanding of what the physiology is, um, and to ensure that we are appropriately treating this vessel. So what we've done in this case, we put an uh, angiographic wire down, and then a pressure wire. Okay. So we change the fluoroscopy to 15 frames per second, which is necessary for the system to pick up the pullback of the wire. You see, you see it jumping up. A big jump up there, which actually is a little bit more proximal to the stenosis. It's probably right on that severe lesion. And then there's no significant gradient more proximally. We're just coming back to the proximal vessel now. Great, we can just do a, a drift check there and it's exactly one. So we're very happy with that. Great, so now that screen, I've got a joystick down here that you can't see me moving, but I'm just moving it out here and I'm just gonna click on the, um, on that button and that will give, bring up uh, the sync vision co-registration. Now, so, so this is a really nice illustration of, uh, of the use of this system. So all these yellow dots at this point suggest this is where the maximum benefit or the maximum delta gain we can get. So I can actually measure here and I can scroll up starting to cover that sort of area. So if we treat this uh, vessel over a 24 millimeter length, we'll get a delta gain of 0.49, which is obviously enormous, and we'll bring our IFR up to 0.87 from its uh, existing level. So clearly that's the area we're going to target. We know angiogram. So you can see we've found a very severe lesion we see on the angiogram, but we've confirmed it with physiology. And the big step up is across that lesion, but also a bit more proximal. Um, so that's the co-registration in action, and it really helps us to understand what's going on. However, you need to understand what's within the stents to really influence how we manage things. And I think intracoronary imaging now is mandated for uh, stent failure. Now this is re really re uh, reinforced by the consensus paper that was published last year in the European Heart Journal by the consensus group that really has this in the, as part of the message for different mechanisms of stent failure. Intracoronary imaging really is so important. 
because we need to differentiate between simple intimal hyperplasia that's relatively straightforward to treat versus under expanded stents versus near atherosclerosis. Now, both techniques, whether you have IBIS or OCT, are really helpful. So if you only have one, it doesn't really matter. But if you've got both, you need to think about which one would I choose for which case. It's quite an interesting slide taken from the paper uh, towards your screen on the side. You can see in the longitudinal section, both IBIS and OCT do demonstrate the thrombus. With OCT, you have a light attenuation because the thrombus doesn't allow you to see those stent struts, but you do see them quite well on the IBIS. Indeed, also on the IBIS, you see a bit further afield where you can see the actual positive remodeling of the vessel and the elastic lamina beyond the stent. What you do see better on OCT, of course, is the stent strut coverage, either proximal or distal to that particular thrombotic lesion, but also you can see peristent problems, peristent calcification and so forth, and you probably have a better understanding of stent under expansion too. So really important to have both of these techniques available if you can, but as I say, if you've only got one, it doesn't matter, but it's important to use, I think, in stent failure cases. And also with the IBIS, we're able to use co-registration, and we can link the co-registration with, in fact, what we've picked up from the uh, co-registration on the pressure wire. So that creates a phenomenon as tri-registration, where we have all three modalities, the angiogram, the IFR, and the IBIS, all interacting together to really try and define where best to manage this particular vessel and, of course, lesion. It probably explains why the drug coated balloon technique we used last time was ineffective because we didn't really deal with the initial problem. So I think the blue is fairly accurate. So that gives us an area of 5.8, minimum, uh, a maximum diameter 2.7, 2.8. And we'll just um, save that. And then um, as we come proximal with the IVUS, I jumped a bit there, sorry. So let's measure it there. That is is a area that looks less good. So we'll measure the section area there. So that's 5.3. So similar measurement, but is a more proximal segment. You think it might be a little bit bigger. And then as we come a bit more proximal, um, there we measure that as well. We're just making some serial measurements to try and understand what we're dealing with. So 4.7, so actually it's getting smaller at that point. So interesting, it's actually proximal to where we see the angiographic lesion. So that implies to me that that may be the area we need to focus on. So it's, so the co-registration is quite useful. So it's around here, uh, which is paradoxical to the lesions here, but we're actually needing to correct. Stents has expanded more distally. So I think the image in here is, Quite helpful. So there's probably this whole section, it gets a bit better here, it looks a little bit better, but still slight eccentricity. At this point here, let's measure it here, see what it is, it looks bigger here. Uh, so these automated measurements are quite quick, 6.3, so 4.7, 6.3, so quite a big difference there. So I think we are dealing with some under expansion at that sort of second bookmark here. So I think that's where we can apply our laser. So Sam, I think while we're doing some more measurements, would you mind just turning on the laser machine uh, and we can boot up and then we can show you the laser setup. So as you can see, the benefit here of this system is that the courage to uh, pressure wire suggested the lesion where we see the angiogram is very tight, was obviously very significant. But often in stent failure, there's multiple mechanisms at play. So not only is there near minimal hyperplasia here, but also proximal to that lesion, there is under expanded stent. And that may be part of the changing flow dynamics that has led to the problem further downstream. So imaging really is crucial and has really helped us here. So let's talk about all the different uh, preparation techniques we have available. So first of the Angiosculpt, self uh, semi-compliant balloon with a nitinol band around it. I like this device. Um, I think it's a good uh, tool. Um, all scoring balloons are quite useful, but this one particularly is very deliverable. It works well in terms of being able to expand without slipping. Um, often you find uh, non-compliant balloons, for instance, will slip in a slippery lesion such as new interval hyperplasia. And it's very safe. You can go up to high pressure, just undersizing by about half a millimeter uh, instead of going one to one. Um, it's got a very deliverable nose cone, so it's very simple to get down the vessel. And you can see in the profile, you can see the wire 
wrapped around on our clear stem image in there. With a de novo lesion, you can see that it works very effectively at scoring into the tissue and creating these little micro fractures. And the same can be said in the sort of fibrocalcific lesions. So it can be very helpful at trying to expand the lesion uh, and prevent instant recoil that you often see when you just use a non-compliant balloon. So Endoscope is uh, one of the tools we use, but the other tool we're going to use in this case is also the Excima laser coronary uh, atherectomy device. Now, uh, laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And this is a bit of a physics slide, which I'm not gonna go through in great detail, but basically light is equivalent to energy and it has a wavelength. And the wavelength of the laser light we use in the body is 308 nanometers, that's ultraviolet light. Now, the importance of that is it's got a very short wavelength and therefore a shallow penetration depth, so it doesn't damage deep tissue. And it's the absorption characteristics of light that we really favor uh, when we use laser in, in, in the coronary circulation, uh, uh, light being absorbed into tissue to help ablate the tissue. That's the laser catheter in the laser machine you can see there. This is the laser catheter going through uh, in, a, in a model, going through tissue. You can see how it ablates the uh, uh, material quite nicely. The uh, spectrum that you see there illustrates the fact that it's a very short wavelength uh, 308 nanometers. The early lasers were in the infrared spectrum and they tended to cause um, heating of tissue and burning and scarring, which is obviously not very favorable. Now, not only does laser work by light uh, energy, but it also creates this vapor bubble around the catheter, which we can use to ablate the tissue. But the other mechanism of, of way it works is this sonic wave, which you can see in this illustration, it kind of creates uh, momentum away from the catheter into the tissues. And this also helps to break up the more fibrotic tissue. Now, very importantly, you see the contrast and saline slide. Now, you may have seen this before, but this illustrates that we should really only be activating laser in saline for 99.9% .9 of cases. It's off-label to use it in contrast. I will explain that in more detail later. But when we use it in saline, we really eliminate our sections and perforations within the vessel. You get the nice blue hue of the ultraviolet light and it's very safe and very predictable. So when we move on to uh, talk about the other cases, I'll show you where contrast is sometimes used. So it's this interaction of three mechanisms, light wave, sonic wave, and the vapor bubble, that really uh, makes laser very effective. And we have uh, an adjustment on the, the amount of energy we can deliver. There's two types of adjustments we can make. First of all, there's the fluence, which is the amount of energy we're delivering at the catheter tip which is measured in millijoules per millimeter squared. And then there's the frequency or the hertz, which we uh, can also influence. We, when we want to go through harder tissue, we increase the hertz, so we get sort of more penetration, if you like. When we're dealing with soft tissue, like this example of a thrombus in an LAD, we just need low fluence. With a more resistant plaque, we need higher fluence. And you can see the diameter of the vapor bubble with the higher fluence is greater, affecting more energy. There are four types of laser catheter that we commonly use in the coronary circulation. Um, the 0.9 millimeter is the most commonly used. It's six French deliverable. And I like it for two reasons. One is it gives the maximal energy deliverable, so that's 80 over 80. And also it gives the maximal timing of laser delivery, i.e. 10 seconds on in a five second rest period. This makes the case more fast um, and is more effective because you're delivering more laser. The 1.4 catheter is also six French compatible, but its maximum settings are only 60-40, so it's less good in CTO setting. Um, and it only gives five seconds of uh, lasing before you have to have an automated 10 second rest, which makes the case a little bit longer. The 1.7 catheter is seven French compatible, the same, the same settings as with the 1.4. And finally, there is a 2.0 catheter, which is eight French or 7.5 French compatible. Um, and this we tend to use for big, arteries where there's thrombus um, and we want to get rid of a lot of plaque. Uh, we used to use it in vein graft, but we tend not to do that very often now uh, because we go for the CTO rather than the vein graft. So laser has a number of applications, moderate calcification, failed balloon, either expansion or in terms of uh, balloon delivery, but it's an instant restenosis that we're talking about here. And this is why I like it in restenosis because even if you haven't got an underexpanded stent, laser is quite useful because it not only affects the luminal material, but it also affects the material behind the stent, i.e. the abluminal material. And I think that helps to get the stent expanded. So 
here we move on to the, uh, we're going to go back to the case in a second, just to illustrate exactly. So how we do it in this lab is we set up with the three-way tap, we have the uh, saline put onto the side of the three-way tap. Then I disconnect the contrast and I put that on the top of the three-way tap, like so. And then I reconnect the contrast line back to the manifold. So this is a system we have, which gives us full control uh, of saline contrast. We know what we're given. Contrast going straight, saline coming out the side. The saline's now turned on. It doesn't need to be under pressure, unlike a rotor system, because uh, we're only using it by putting back on the syringe. Perfect. So that beat means the laser machine is ready. So Helen's plugging in her control catheter, and she's going to calibrate the catheter uh, which will calibrate the machine, make sure the machine hasn't got any faults. This is called the proximal coupler, and this fits into the laser machine. Helen? And then the first thing we have to do is calibrate this specific catheter that we've got to the machine so it knows what energy it's delivering. Perfect. These, these catheters are made by hand uh, in Colorado Springs um, by a very dedicated team of uh, individuals. And they're made from glass fibers. And there's 65, I think, glass fibers in this particular catheter. And they're extremely thin, obviously. So it's, it's very precision uh, material that allows the laser light to go from the machine to the catheter, to the patient. Another one. What you can see is that it's also very straightforward monorail. Um, Easy to use, yeah. So there's two aspects to the energy. The first number I said was 80, and that's the fluence, and that's the millijoules per millimeter squared of energy we're actually delivering to the point of contact. And the second number is the frequency, the hertz. Um, and that's also, we use 80. We'll start from about I think start there, yeah. yeah. So you can see it's very deliverable. Um, you can see this calcified artery, uh, low profile, and you can put it through a six-inch guideliner, very straightforward. That is there. What I'm doing now is I've turned the contrast off and I've switched over to the saline syringe and I've filled up with saline. And what we'll do is we'll just do a fluoro and I'll flush out the contrast. So we now see there's no contrast in the system. When you're using laser for most indications, that's always a good thing to do. So we're contrast free at the moment, Helen, so you can go on to live laser. So how are we going to do this? I'm going to uh, inject and then I'll say to Jahanga, you can start and then he'll start lasing and then he'll be able to laze for 10 seconds um, and the machine will automatically cut out with a rest period of five seconds. And at that point, he'll just gently be moving the catheter distal, uh, very slow speed, about half a millimeter per second. So almost imperceptible already. Yeah. You ready? Are we ready, Helen? Good. Okay, I'm injecting. Perfect. So I just want to point out the fact uh, that in that case, you see us wearing the uh, radio, uh, the glasses that protect our eyes against the ultraviolet light. Uh, that's important for all the staff in the cath lab and also the patient uh, because uh, ultraviolet light can affect the retina. So that's just one thing to point out. We've used laser, as you see, uh, we use quite a bit of laser in this case. We use up to 16,000 pulses um, to affect the underexpanded area of the stent. And you'll see now as we move on um, how that uh, results in, the, um, in a better uh, result. Might be worth us coming back and reapplying yeah. energy in that mid yeah. in that midsection. We'll just go a little bit further. Yeah, let's do one more. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Okay, inject. Perfect. A bit more balloon in and your sculpt. Perfect. So. I think the important thing, my understanding of this, is that there's no cluster of dots. There's a lot of small dots, uh, and therefore individual dots. But you're not going to put 
there's nothing you can do to that that's going to make it any different. So I think we've definitely changed the uh, the physiology here in a positive way. Uh, Mr. H came in, uh, we discovered, as predicted, that he had severe restenosis in an LAD that's previously been treated on a number of occasions. With the aid of pressure wire, we discovered that the uh, lesion was severe with very significant flow limitation and adverse coronary physiology. With balloon treatment and subsequent image guidance, we discovered uh, that there was some material within the stent, but also a degree of underexpansion, both in the, in the segment of disease plus more proximally. We applied laser atherectomy both with saline and without saline uh, using about 16,000 pulses. We then used a combination of non-compliant balloons and scoring balloons and just sculpt to get better expansion of the stents. And then we decided to finish with a single drug allutin stent, a 2538 Zients. And then to the top end, after post-dilatation of that stent, we used a uh, drug coated balloon. Uh, our physiology at the end predicted a very good outcome. We had a final effort of IFR of 0.86 with no major gradient across the treated vessel. Um, and the imaging also proved to be re relatively successful. And our fine angiographic images are as good as I think we can get them. So I'd like to thank the team. Great job. So you can see the angiographic image, I think, does look a lot better. Um, and I think we're probably pretty pleased with the result. But there's no telling how this patient will come back. Clearly, what I did on the previous occasion wasn't sufficient. So um, I can tell you now that we did this in December. The patient's been well and he's not had any further symptoms. So I think hopefully we're outside that window of uh, recurrent stent failure and we'll do well. Now, I just draw your attention to this uh, paper that we wrote. The next part of the webinar, we'll be discussing some of the evidence around device use um, within stent failure cases. And it's available on the Radcliffe website if you want to read it but it will go into things in a lot more detail than I'm gonna cover now. So essentially, there's quite a, a bit of data for different devices and techniques. So in terms of uh, therapies, uh, scoring balloon has been compared against POBA, uh, rotablation against POBA, rotation against POBA, and of course, laser versus no laser. None of these studies are huge, but um, they do give some insight into uh, these devices. So the first I will just mention will be scoring balloon versus POBA. And this is in the... Uh, um, study which was uh, chaired by uh, Robert Byrne uh, from Munich and this randomized trial of uh, 200 or 50 odd patients uh, in four centers in Germany uh, com basically compared scoring balloon with angiosculpt versus control with non-compliant balloon. You can see that the patient demographics were fairly similar between the groups, they were quite complex lesions, fairly focal uh, in terms of restenosis and what we found or what they found was that um, the scoring uh, balloon group had um, angiographic follow-up six to eight months, had uh, less diameter stenosis and a slightly bigger lumen than the control group with non-compliant balloons, suggesting that it did improve uh, the preparation of the vessel. Of course, it's too small a study really to demonstrate any clinical efficacy, but it certainly is a hypothesis generating. And interestingly, uh, there were no, no more dissections in the scoring uh, balloon group than in the non-compliant balloon group. So effective and safe um, and quite a good technique. For laser, there's a, not so much evidence. This paper um, was published as a retrospective study of cases treated with laser and, uh, and treated without laser. And you can see that those with laser tended to have a smaller luminal diameter and a greater stenosis. And whilst there was no major difference uh, between the groups of the very small study, what they did show was that there was bigger gain when you use laser compared to not using laser in terms of the luminal area. Um, there's a little bit more data from an Italian study. This is six centers in Italy. Um, this is 80 patients with focal restenosis uh, treated from uh, 2010 to 2013. They used relatively low settings of laser energy uh, with saline as per protocol. They also used adjunctive balloons and they used drug eluting balloons after laser. Um, they, the drug lutein balloon was used at the end of the case, as we would conventionally do, um, and they had pretty good results. They had uh, angina occurring in up to 50% of patients in one year, but you can see that that was really confined to sort of class one to class two, rather than a very severe angina. Um, so suggesting efficacy uh, and safety, um, they were capable of actually achieving a, a reduction in the stenosis by about 40% with laser. And then, of course, that was uh, further improved by using the balloon. 
So having done the laser, you then have to use balloons to expand, and then you get quite a big reduction uh, in the stenosis and a nice luminal gain. Six month follow up suggested that there had been an increase in, in, in the luminal area, um, but clearly it's not a huge study, but it gives uh, an idea. So in the BMS area, of course, there was lots of comparisons with different devices, uh, drug eluting balloons versus drug eluting stents, um, and these studies, I won't go through them, but they're all available in the paper. Um, we're not really using bare metal stents, so I don't really want to focus too much on it. Uh, brachytherapy was compared against drug eluting stents with uh, with brachytherapy being inferior quite frequently. We don't really use brachytherapy in the UK, but certainly in, um, in America, I think they're still being used. Um, but when we move on to the more sort of contemporary devices, and this is an interesting area uh, in drug eluting stent restenosis, whether to use drug coated balloons or whether to use stents. Now, RIBS4 was a very interesting study. This is uh, from uh, Spain, a multi center trial. Um, and what they tried to do, and they did very successfully, was to compare whether a drug eluting balloon or a drug eluting stent with ever alignments would be effective uh, in patients treated for restenosis, which was generally focal. They compared three, uh, had 3,000 patients split between the two groups, as you can see in the uh, flow dynamic with angiographic follow up. And this is the three year follow up data. Now, there was a difference at one year in favor of the stent. So the stent appeared to be superior at one year. Um, but what's important, this is all driven by target lesion revascularization rather than any other hard point, hard end point, was that in fact there was no difference after one year in terms of the two groups. So if you do use a drug coated balloon, it suggests that actually you'll get fairly favorable results uh, if you get a good result in the first uh, year beyond one year, which is obviously important in terms of both of efficacy and safety. So an important study. And when they looked at subgroup analysis, no major difference except for, interestingly, in the bigger arteries, the drug-coated balloon appeared to be superior, whereas in the smaller arteries, uh, the drug eluting stent appeared to be superior, which is perhaps is not how we necessarily think about it. In terms of uh, other sort of techniques and devices in stent failure, well, different drugs and have been compared against each other, whether you mix the drugs, but really, I think most people really are sticking to either a drug eluting stent or a drug-coated balloon rather than being too uh, worried about what type of um, stent they're actually using in this situation. Now, under-expanded stents is a very difficult area because the devices we have available for this are very limited. So I'll take you back to 2009. So this is 10 years ago, almost exactly again. And this was a case I had to deal with uh, then. So it's a complex lesion in the LAD. Um, I rotoblated with a 1-5 uh, burr initially. The subsequent non-compliant balloon 1-to-1 one -one did not expand. Um, as you'll see in the next picture um, at that lesion. I took a bigger burr, 2.0, and that went through and I'd spent some time ablating the tissue quite nicely. And then uh, again, the non-compliant balloon and scoring balloons and cutting balloons, none of those would expand. And you'll see that coming up in a second. So still failure of the balloons to expand. And the IVUS really predicted a severe lesion, but I still hadn't modified enough. Now I made a mistake, a rookie mistake, I guess, uh, and I put in some stents thinking that if I put a stent in, I'd then be able to expand it, go into higher pressure um, because I have the vessel protected. Now you'll see, of course, what happens if you put a stent into an underexpanded lesion, it doesn't expand. So the stent is now underexpanded and that's a bad situation. So I took an OPN up to 40 atmospheres and I still could not make this uh, lesion yield. I brought the patient back two weeks later uh, having discussions with various colleagues uh, around Europe. And basically I went for laser as the um, only option that we could think of. You can see how severely tight that um, uh, stenosis is now within the um, uh, LAD stent. So you couldn't leave that because the patient would almost certainly uh, have an occluded vessel uh, before too long. Um, and the patient really wasn't a great case for a, a cabbage. So I used laser 2.0 and then also a 0.9, which is not shown. And after 10,000 pulses, the same balloon I used last time fully expands and we get a great result. So this was really the first time we'd used an under, uh, laser and under expanded stent to this um, very dramatic effect. Um, and since then we've sort of done a few cases, quite a few, probably about 20 or 30 over the years. Um, and it really has been very effective. CSA is not, is pretty reasonable. It's not perfect expansion, but it's good enough and certainly better than how we would have left it had we not used laser. For this case, we did write up and we've done a series of these now 
um, over time and uh, colleagues have, have sent us patients from uh, in the region. There is a, a little bit of data out there. This is the element registry, uh, Italian, 28 patients collected from 2009 to 2011. Uh, you see what the endpoint was, just a, a small increase in the luminal area. And what they discovered uh, was that laser used with uh, contrast in this particular case series, they didn't use it with saline, they actually gave contrast during the case. Now, I've mentioned already that that's actually off label, but when you're really dealing with very tough cases, you sometimes do have to use contrast, but it's important to see why it's off label. You get these macromolecules being formed and you get heat generation and you have a higher risk of perforating the vessel. So you have to be very careful and it's not something for uh, an inexperienced person to be doing. Um, there is some case reports, similarly, of uh, using laser in underexpanded stents. This is from New York. And, and what's interesting in this, as I've highlighted on the lower panel, is that you, that you won't see necessarily a uh, change in the luminal area after laser. It's only then when you go back with the balloon that you see the change. So that's important to recognize. You have to use a combination of laser and then a balloon. But it's the peristent calcification that laser seems to be very good at dealing with when you have an underexpanded stent. This publication recently in the Euro, uh, Euro Intervention Journal has just come out, very interesting. Uh, they've also looked at about 80 patients with peristent calcification and they divided them up into patients who they used laser in and those who they didn't. And what you can see is the patients who had laser pre-procedure had a more severe stenosis uh, with a smaller luminal area. And then after laser, they had the most to gain, similar to the previous study I showed you. And they use both with and without contrast. And those that had contrast used, it did actually tend to cause more fracture and affect the more deeper calcification, really showing that if you have an amplified effect, it can be more efficacious, but hazardous, potentially. So all the tools I've mentioned creates a sort of algorithmic approach. And what we've tried to do, and certainly within the paper, is to try and produce this algorithm that will make everyone's life easier in terms of dealing with stent failure. It's not perfect, but it gives an idea of how to do it. So if you see an angiographically severe lesion, uh, then it's different. But if it's not severe, then I think you should think about hemodynamic significance. Just pop a pressure wire down, because if it's negative, which it might be, you can leave the patient alone. If it's positive, then I think the next step really is to do intracoronary imaging. And of course, this applies as well if you have an acute patient with an unstable lesion. So intracoronary imaging provides all the information we need. Is it near into a hyperplasia, in which case a scoring or cutting balloon might be very effective? Is there under expansion of a stent, in which case we need to think about perhaps atherectomy, perhaps rotation atherectomy? The caveat being that this can be hazardous, if you, particularly in a newly, newly implanted stent, because the bird can become entrapped. Um, laser, I think, is more efficacious and safer. Um, and the new kit on the block, if you like, is the lithoplasty uh, with uh, shockwave, which can be useful. We have used it, and I'll show you a case. But the evidence for it, and uh, certainly the suggestions from manufacturers, is that we perhaps shouldn't be using it in these type of cases. Um, undersized stent, then I think we can think about scoring balloons and non-compliant balloons. And finally, if you have edge problems around the stent, which may be de novo disease or it may be geographical miss, then I think we need to treat that. That's often treated with a drug uh, stent, which makes sense. Under size of a balloon, you're probably going to uh, treat just with a drug coated balloon if it's a recently deployed stent. Whereas if you have NIH or you have under expansion of a stent, you've seen from the data, you could choose between DCB or you could choose between a drug eluting stent. So, what I'm going to try and do now is just show you some cases where we uh, performed PCI and gone through the stent failure algorithm and just try and demonstrate if it's actually useful or not. So, here we have an 80 year old patient. So previous PCI to the LAD uh, in 2009, um, he basically had a further stent about six months later, um, and then that reached the nose and probably put into an intramyocardial segment. And I think the mechanism there may be, as I'll show you, maybe stent fracture. He then got severe restenosis and ended up having a cabbage and a aortic valve replacement at the same time a year after that. So um, he was fine for about eight years and came in with a non-STEMI. And you'll see his pictures, a little bit complex case. So we start out with the Lima shots and I've tried to abbreviate this case. So you can see an insertional stenosis uh, at the Lima into the LAD. Um, and I think you get a, a flavor also on the next slide that within the native vessel, 
there's quite a hinge point between the stent and I think that although we didn't confirm it 100 percent we couldn't access it for intracoronary imaging possibly that's an area of stent fracture in the native LAD. So first of all we performed imaging of the um, uh, insertional stenosis you saw the native LAD stent there just going off screen and um, that showed us a, a severe stenosis so we then went on to uh, treat that with balloons. It's actually difficult to get balloons across this um, and eventually managed to get balloons and then got a stent in, um, again, I was guided. And I think because of all the manipulation you'll see uh, with guideliner you used to deliver, we ended up with a uh, guideliner related to section of the proximal lemur. Again, the IVUS was very helpful. It illustrated that we had this uh, hematoma in the vessel that you can see on the IVUS imaging coming back now. Um, and I think really the only option to treat this was to uh, actually stent the lemur, not something I do routinely, but uh, in a, this sort of situation, there wasn't much else we could do. So uh, I put a drug eluting stent in the lemur graft, as you can see, just position it there carefully uh, with the guideliner, um, just giving a little bit of contrast, showing that we had it pretty much back at the ostium. And then once we delivered that, we could then go on and look at the native, which is really where I want to focus now. So the native vessel was obviously very stenosed. Osteal lesion there you saw was significant and um, previous dents in the LAD that looked okay angiographically. But a pressure wire gave us an IFR of 0.35, measuring that into the diagonal. And you can see here very clearly, again, uh, with the co-registered system, that we have two step ups, one in the mid LAD by, by the sort of um, an estimate, well, just proximal to the previous dents uh, where it's actually uh, fractured. But that's obviously within a stent and it's obviously quite severe. And then at the ostium, again, we also have a significant step up. So we are planning, we're gonna treat this. So the imaging again helps just to define exactly what's going on here. We've got a bit of near interval hyperplasia. We've got some under expansion of the stents um, and you've got an osteal lesion there. You see um, the green arrow, which is quite severe calcification. Probably not, it's about 270 degrees. So. This is very affected by uh, angiosculpt quite nicely. You don't need to use rotational arthrectomy here. So we go on and we use angiosculpt both in the mid vessel um, and at the ostium. And it's very good at preparing the vessel. And then we're able to complete the case with uh, a drug coated balloon in the middle. That's the angiosculpt going in. Um, and there's the non compliant balloon at the ostium after angiosculpt. Two stents uh, go in proximally. Um, and uh, we just put a drug coated balloon in the middle. And that's the final result. And we did check the IFR, I haven't got the slide, but actually um, we managed to uh, solve that gradient and got a, and got a, a sort of value around the normal level, uh, certainly around 0.89, 0 0.90. And the IVUS shows uh, reasonably good expansion of the previous stent and also of the newly implanted stent. So using the tools really to try and optimize the case as best we can. So when we take that case then through the algorithm to try and work out um, how we affected it. So we started out with stent failure in the LAD, uh, which was long-standing. Um, it wasn't critical, so we used um, uh, hemodynamics to try and understand whether it was important, particularly as it was into a diagonal vessel. Then we moved on to intracoronary imaging. We discovered the end of hyperplasia. We found an under-expanded stent. We used scoring balloon mainly, and then drug-coated balloon in the mid-vessel. We found some uh, undersizing as well, score non-compliant edge problem, i.e. the ostium, and we treated that with a new, new drug gluten stent um, to get the final result. This next case is a, a, perhaps a simpler case. 76-year-old patient presenting with acute uh, problem in the LAD. This is a previous 2006. She had a stent to the LAD. Um, interestingly, a, pretty much a direct stent with a cipher, 275-23. We don't treat people like that now. We tend to predilate everything, which I think is right. So this includes, you know, 14 years later, so it's very late stent thrombosis. Um, so we've got to try and understand what the mechanism is here. You can imagine that with a first generation stent, there may be several factors at play. So after recanalizing the vessel um, with a, a 3 balloon and a wire, we then perform intracoronary imaging, and that's really to help us understand how best to manage this particular case. Um, so you'll see in a second the intracoronary imaging with IVUS, and on that's the uh, live sort of not the live, but the recorded uh, feed from the IVUS. But on the stills, you can see three areas of interest. Um, de novo disease, progression at the distal end of the previous stent. Small stent in the middle, where there's positive remodeling and probably just, you know, what sometimes are presenting as late uh, uh, malapposition. And then proximally, we have a relatively small stent within quite a big vessel, 
2.75 stent, and this is really a sort of 4.540 ostium of the LAD. So we had a few areas to try and target. Um, because it's a first generation stent, we're going to be focusing on using a contemporary drug leading stent. Um, so we're not going to be too worried about putting another stent in here. And what we do is basically balloon up further with a 3.5 non-compliant balloon. Uh, and we use a couple of stents, a 3.0 distilling and a 3.5 back to the ostium and then use a 4.5 balloon um, to really expand it according to what the IRIS criteria is telling us. And you can see the angiographic appearance is very favorable. Um, and similarly, the uh, IVUS images show very nice expansion of the stent throughout, particularly at the ostium. So putting that one through the algorithm, we have stent failure in LAD. It's obviously critical, so we don't need a pressure wire. We go straight to coronary imaging to try and define the problem. We find mixed problems, as you'd expect, NIH and undersizing with edge problem as well. Mainly non-compliant balloon is quite effective here. We put in new drug looting stents and then we get a good result um, and move on. Next case then is a more complex stent failure. This is an 82 year old patient, previous uh, intervention elsewhere. And you can see that he came in, uh, I think on a Saturday or a Sunday evening, um, and he basically had very critical disease with some hemodynamic compromise. Now, intracoronary imaging here really defined what was going on. It told me that there was a lot of stent under expansion in these LAD stents and in the circumflex stents, um, which you can really get a flavor for on the angiogram. And the left main was also heavily compromised. You can see here how severe uh, the tissue is around this stent, but also how under expanded the stent is there in the LAD. And you'll see in a second when we move on to the circumflex, a similar appearance with an osteo lesion of the circumflex, which is really quite severe. Tricky to get across the circumflex initially, small balloons, eventually took a 3.5 balloon. Looks like it goes up angiographically, um, which is interesting because uh, when you then take iris through down through the circumflex, you actually see that although it goes up, it just goes up and then recoils straight back down because it doesn't really affect the uh, osteo circumflex at all. And the CSA around here is around three millimeters, 3.5 millimeters. So very undersized and, and, and very under expanded. Um, and there may even be multiple layers of stent, difficult to tell on the IVUS. So really the next step is to try and use a different device. So I've taken angiosculpt here to high pressure. Normally angiosculpt is very effective, but in this case, the degree of calcification just really beats the angiosculpt and it just can't cope with it. So we have to think about an alternative technique. Now, Shockwave has been recently, uh, we've had it for about six months, and here, I think it's a perfect device. So we go up to four atmospheres, we deliver, I deliver 50 pulses uh, of energy, and it's actually pretty effective. We don't necessarily see the change on the angiogram, but it directs the energy into that tissue and causes multiple fractures, which we don't necessarily see, but certainly after we've taken another non-compliant balloon, we do get the lumen up to about seven millimeters squared, which is a big improvement. I put some distal stents in uh, to de novo disease that was untreated before, um, using buddy wire technique to get the stents down, it's quite challenging. Finish off with kissing balloons. I also finish off the, uh, some, the, the IVL balloon by using it in the LAD as well, just to make sure we don't waste any energy because there was under expansion there too. Final kissing, drug coated balloons, no new stents. And the final result, whilst not perfect, is, is certainly better than what we started with uh, and hopefully will provide some durability. Um, of course, bypass might be another option for this patient if um, they fail to, to uh, do well with um, these stents that have been implanted. So put in this case through the algorithm, it's a bit more complex. So angiographically critical, I think you'd agree. Uh, so go straight for intracoronary imaging after pre-dilatation. Under expansion, we've definitely discovered. Um, scoring a non-compliant balloons, but it's really uh, the IVL treatment that really helps to get this uh, stent expanded. Um, to the point we can actually leave the case um, and didn't put any new stents in uh, proximally, but did put some in distally to cover that new disease and just use drug coated balloons in the uh, left main. This next case is, a, is a, um, a different type of case. So the next two cases, final two, we're going to look at a couple of occluded vessels. This is an LAD uh, occlusion. The stent was put in probably around 2009 in another center. Um, patient was quite well until recently. Uh, and then developed um, significant angina. They've had an angiogram that showed a blocked LAD um, and had went on to have MRI scan and showed ischemia and viability. And you'll see in the case, that as a proximal right coronary stenosis, I treat first with um, a uh, drug-leading stent, I was guided. There's retrograde fitting of the distal LAD through multiple collaterals. 
and we're able to use the contralateral injections to really uh, use anterograde wire technique quite easily to get across the um, CTO, it wasn't a difficult CTO, um, and then exchange out for different wires, de-escalate to a soft wire, then perform uh, intravascular ultrasound to understand what's going on within this LAD, trying to work out the mechanism. And this slide really captures all the detail. So um, what we see at the very proximal end of the vessel is a, is a de novo lesion at the ostium, it's quite severe, uh, which is new, new plaque uncovered. In the mid-vessel within the stent, we find a relatively small stent with tissue within the stent and positive remodeling. We also found a gap between the two stents that had been implanted before, and within that gap, there was a severe lesion. And there's also some tissue distal uh, to, to, to the uh, most distal stent. So with iris imaging, then we predilate everything up um, and we get a really good result in uh, angiographically and also confirmed on iris. Um, that's the iris and uh, angiographic correlation between the two. And going through the algorithm here, this is stent failure again, uh, presented as a CTO. Angiographically critical, well, it certainly is not going to perform pressure wire over that. So you're going to do imaging straight away. We find under expansion, we treat that with scoring and non-compliant. We find under sizing, we treat that with scoring and non-compliant balloon. And we find new disease, which we're going to cover with DES. Um, and in fact, because they're a relatively old stent, we're going to cover the whole segment with the drug eluting stent um, and not be worried about using uh, DCB in this particular case. So quite straightforward, quite effective use of the algorithm here. The final case <clears throat> is also quite a challenging case. Now, this is from just a few weeks ago. It's a 52-year-old patient who uh, has had stenting from about 2004 several times to the same vessel, to the LAD. More recently, it had been at another center where it presented acutely, and they had tried to uh, treat the LAD um, with a rotation atherectomy, having found an under-expanded stent. So this was the uh, case from before in another center. You can see that there is a very severe LAD stenosis, um, and basically they use rotation atherectomy once we fiber, they put a new stent in, um, but that didn't expand and they took OPNs to very high pressure and nothing would expand. So the patient came to me probably about four weeks later and in that time, I called it a CTO, but by definition it not really is a CTO because it's only been about four weeks. But you can see that the LAD is now occluded, which fits with the patient's symptoms. He's now very symptomatic. Um, he, I discussed cabbage with him before the procedure. He really didn't want cabbage. But it would have been easy at this point to stop the case and just send him for a bypass uh, and say he failed um, stenting. But, you know, I thought it'd be quite straightforward to open and we had a strategy to try and treat this. So um, I used a dual lumen catheter to make sure we um, got down through the stents quite safely. I could have used cross boss, but I thought it'd be quite easy to wire, which it was. Um, and when, when you balloon up, you can see on the clear stent technology, a very under expanded stent um, very, ob very obvious um, with, with just, just, just the radiographic techniques. So um, having opened things up, I thought the best technique to really understand what's going on would be OCT. So here we see the OCT images and I'll pause it here just to show you um, that distal, we have a lumen uh, of about 4.95 in the red box. Uh, proximal, we have a lumen of about 4.28 millimeters squared in the blue box, but at the lesion point, the lumen area is 0.89, with basically the catheter almost being gripped by the stent. And what we can see, there's a bit of attenuation of the stent struts, but there is definitely more than one layer of stent, possibly two or three, maybe even four layers of stent in this one particular spot where there's complete under expansion. So very extreme case. So this is not easy to deal with uh, using any tools we have currently available. Um, so I start off with laser, as that's my kind of default in this position. So I've used it with uh, 10,000 pulses with saline, because that's what I always do, because I think it's safer. But if that isn't effective, and it was, then I just use it in the absence of saline. I don't give contrast, I just use it in the blood pool, which effect is a bit like using it with contrast. Again, that's off-label, you should be using it with saline, um, but in this extreme case, there's not much else we can do. Now, OCT, after doing this technique, did get the lumen up, uh, both distally and proximally, as you can see, and in the area of uh, stent under expansion, we got an increase up to 1.91. But I didn't think this was really enough for long-term durability. So, you know, I could have given more laser at this point, but I just thought, well, the balloon expands, but I thought I'm gonna use a different technique. So once again, we've had some success with using intravascular lithoplasty. So that's what I went for here, 3012 balloon, 
um, and I delivered the full uh, 80 uh, pulses in this one spot, which I could clearly define between the two electrodes very easily on the angiogram using the radiographic technique. And you'll see in a second the OCT images um, having used uh, the IVL. And there is some improvement, but again, it's not perfect. So I'll pause it here so you can see that very clearly. We've got the distal end up to uh, 6.5, proximal up to 7.5, but the area around the lesion is now still 3.3, which is a lot better than what we started with, but I, you know, I didn't think it would be 100% perfect for this particular patient and not good enough. So I've got laser on the table, I'm gonna go back with laser, and this time I'm gonna use laser with contrast. Again, off-label, it's not something we recommend, but in extreme cases, it can be really helpful. And I think in this case, it really was, because not only did we get a better result uh, distally and proximally, but also in the lesion itself, we got the lumen up to 4.3. Now, I think it was aided by the use of an OPM in this situation. So having softened everything up with all the devices, the uh, OPN balloon, double-coated balloon, I could take up to high pressure and really expand the stent. I also put a stent in distally because there was a need for that. There was in-segment restenosis. And of course, proximally as well, there was quite a severe lesion at the ostium. And I had to treat that back to the left main. So in the end, I put in stent distal, proximal, and then I use a uh, little more non-compliant in the middle, a uh, drug-coated balloon in the middle. Looks pretty good expansion, but you can see over about a three millimeter length, there is still uh, an area of under expansion with a lumen of around 4.3, 4.5. So not perfect, but I think a lot better than what we started. And of course, I think if you fail this time, then I think it would be uh, a lemma graft and the LED being the only solution. But in this particular scenario, when you're dealing with that degree of multiple stent under expansion, there's probably no technique that's perfect on its own. And I think you have to be prepared to use combination therapy. So in going through the algorithm, we, have, we dealt with a very severe lesion clearly because it was a CTO or type of CTO. Imaging was used up front with uh, OCT, under expansion, some NIH, of course. We used atherectomy. They previously used rotational, but relatively small burr. I used laser. Uh, we used intravascular lithoplasty. And I used drug coated balloon in the middle where it was uh, not fully expanded. I'm going to put more stent there. Drug gluten stent distal, drug gluten stent proximal into the left main. And I think it's this combination of therapy that we have available that we have to interact with and be prepared to use. It makes things more expensive, but ultimately we can be more successful. We coined the term razor when we use laser and rotor together. There's lots of terminology now with laser shock, rotor shock, all being used. And I guess in some ways this was kind of a razor shock using all three modalities, although staged um, in this approach. So that's the, that's the final case uh, I wanted to show you. And I'm now going to just show you the conclusion slides. So I think hopefully now we've gone through uh, the interacting factors that you've seen, lesion and mechanical factors can be influenced by the operator and that's the ones we can focus on to try and make sure we minimize the risk of stent failure. Um, you've seen hopefully that pressure wire is a very good tool uh, trying to illustrate whether lesions are significant or not. And the IFR tool with co-registration using sync vision is really quite helpful. Similarly, once we have a, a a lesion that needs treatment, i.e. physiologically significant or severe, then I think OCT or IVUS both give very good information and help guide what we're doing, working out the mechanics and also directing which therapies we use. Um, and in terms of the devices, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I think the algorithm gives us some sort of idea of how to move through and choose our devices um, because there are many devices around and it's knowing which ones we will be successful in each case. And, I guess the experience is something that, uh, that is important here as well. So that's the, uh, my concluding slide. I just wanna say thank you to a number of people. Certainly, uh, I wanna say thank you to my cath lab, uh, not just for the uh, help with this uh, webinar and the cases, but also over the years, uh, all the nurses, physiologists and radiographers, they're great. Um, they put people first patient wise, and they also provide a great place to uh, work and a very good educational unit. I want to thank my consultant colleagues and all my interventional fellows, uh, particularly to Jahangir Din, who is our clinical director and is an excellent operator and a great person to work with, as you can see from the videos. And Nick Powell is now in Australia on a BCIS fellowship, um, who is a previous Oxford trainee who helped to, uh, to write the paper with me. Uh, thanks to him. 
And of course, I want to thank Radcliffe Cardiology for helping to uh, run this webinar, uh, particularly Jonathan, who's really helped out a lot. And of course, I want to thank Philips, who sponsored the whole uh, event. Great. So I hope uh, that presentation has been helpful to everyone who's uh, been in and listening and uh, viewing it. Um, some good questions have been posted uh, during that uh, last 60 minutes, and I'm just going to try and run through some of them now. Uh, the first question uh, relates to intravascular imaging, of course, um, and the question is really, which is my preference for intravascular imaging? And a similar question is, what contribution did I think imaging made to restenosis? So, firstly, in terms of preference, well, I mean, we're lucky in Bournemouth because we have all three modalities. We have both solid state, IVUS, rotation and IVUS, all integrated, and OCT. Uh, for me, IVUS is good because it's rapid and contrast-free. It's quite easy to detect major then under expansion and check whether it's hyper in more detail and understand if there's been positive remodeling. I think with OCT, the big advantage is thrombus can be very clearly identified as opposed to perhaps other material. We can look for peristent abnormalities such as calcium uh, and perhaps choose a device to uh, most appropriately treat this. And of course, look at under-expanded stents is very easy. Calcification beyond the stent also very easy with OCT, looking at thickness and length. And also, strut coverage and malapposition is very clear on OCT. So I think both techniques have their advantages. And I think in all the cases you've seen, um, the mechanisms behind the failure is much more apparent with the imaging than if we just use the angiogram. And I think it helps direct us to which device to use. and uh, makes it more of an effective therapy as well, as we can check to see how we've actually left the, uh, the treated vessel. Uh, the second question uh, talks about... Um, uh, whether it's an interesting one actually are the cases of ISR you see down to lack of IVUS uh, use in the first place or more related to older generation stents well we use a lot of IVUS in our center perhaps about 35 percent of cases but we still see about 10 percent of ISR I think the thing is uh, whilst IVUS use is more common perhaps in our center it, the systematic use of imaging where you really take time uh, and you do multiple runs where you check each device has prepared the vessel so forth and checked your uh, end result uh, is probably much less common because it takes longer and I think that's more of a factor I think systematic imaging probably gives you a better result um, but we also have a very long legacy of treating complex high syntax type score uh, cases in elderly patients so I think the effect of first generation devices is definitely there but I think it also brings on to another question about what is the importance of optimal lesion preparation um, and I think that's probably more of an issue at the outset I kind of alluded to it at the beginning of the talk but I think doing a good job in the very first place is probably the best way to avoid stent failure. Um, and I think preparing lesions, particularly with calcium modification techniques, is such an important thing. And I think we're realizing it more and more now. Um, and this is probably the future of intervention, spending longer in the first uh, instance and getting it right first time, uh, which is obviously a very good um, uh, mnemonic, as we're finding out in all of our cardiology departments in the UK. Um, Another question here is about how important is the role of IFR in the setting of instant restenosis? Well, I would say it's similar to really de novo disease. It takes away the ambiguity of angiographic lesion assessment. You're not trying to just uh, decide based on an angiogram. Um, and I think in, with IFR, of course, it's advantageous with any of the rest of the disease. You don't have to give it denosine. That's quicker, more efficient, and probably kinder to the patient as well because perhaps 10% have problems with the denosine. Um, and I think the pullback tool, as you saw with the Think Vision, is also very helpful uh, at really defining exactly where the angiographic stenosis um, is, uh, well, whether it correlates with the uh, pullback and the, uh, the biggest physiology uh, deficit. So it's quite a useful tool. Uh, got a question about laser. Um, does laser affect the stent itself? Um, this is a, a quite a common question for people who never use laser. Um, it's, well, as far as I know, it doesn't affect the metal at all. There's been some experiments in benches, and it, you can heat the metal up to quite high temperatures, and it doesn't really affect it. But obviously, it doesn't get that hot uh, in vivo. So it doesn't affect the metal. The effect on the polymer and drug is a little bit unknown. Um, what I tend to do is if I've used laser in a state, uh, case of stent failure, and there's one layer of stent, um, then I'd use a new drug eluting stent just to be sure, uh, four layers. I'm not sure it's wise to put in a fifth layer. So in that situation, even after laser use, I would just use a drug-coated balloon um, as my final sort of device 
to use. Uh, another question regarding laser uh, states, uh, the evidence base seems to be small on laser use. Are larger studies needed to validate this approach? Um, well, I agree. I think the evidence base is very small in this field. Um, I think one of the reasons that is, is because of the relatively small cohort of patients who have uh, stent failure in general, but also particularly under expanded stent where perhaps laser is most effective. And it's quite a challenge, therefore, to design a randomized control trial uh, and make it work um, in, a community, in the community. Uh, it's also difficult to really define what the endpoints are in terms of uh, your um, uh, success and failure modes. But I think maybe we uh, need to use devices such as laser in uh, less of a, a bailout situation and perhaps use it more up front and perhaps it's easier to test in that way. Um, you have to obviously design it quite carefully to work out again what endpoints are. But luminal gain is possible. It certainly does remove more material and perhaps a combination of laser with ballooning uh, could be tested against uh, just ballooning in its own right to see whether there is a difference. But I still think you'd need quite a lot of patients to power that appropriately. Uh, then I have another quite important question here about um, about uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. And in what case, uh, case scenarios would I refer a patient for bypass? Well, I mean, I think it's obviously a very important uh, um, way of revascularizing patients. So I don't think we should just stick with stenting uh, every single time, even if we have um, uh, stent failure, we have to be very sensible. I think when patients come back again and again, then I think uh, bypass surgery is a very good uh, method. It becomes more tricky if you have patients who just have problems in the right coronary artery, sending them for a single vein graft is not so appealing. But for patients who have failure in the LAD or in more proximal left main uh, situations, then I think bypass should be considered, discussed with the patient. Um, and brought to an MDT. But um, I think the cases I've shown hopefully do demonstrate that if you do look for the mechanisms carefully, you may be able to avoid bypass. But in some patients, particularly those with risk factors such as diabetes, it may be inevitable, um, and perhaps it's better just to uh, bite the bullet and send the patient uh, for surgery uh, early. Um, so I think that's probably about, we've gone to the end really of this uh, webinar and the Q&A. So um, I'd just like really to thank everyone who's tuned in um, and provided some questions. Um, I'd like again just to thank uh, Radcliffe Cardiology and just to make you aware that this webinar will very shortly be available uh, in full on demand uh, on their website, which is uh, radcliffecardiology.com. You must know because you're obviously tuning in. Um, so please have a look at that. And then if there's any more uh, questions, you can, uh, you can tweet me. Uh, you saw my Twitter handle before. Um, and there's lots of education on the Radcliffe website in addition to uh, today's webinar. Um, and finally, I'd just like to thank uh, all my colleagues again, the Royal Bournemouth Hospital, uh, who I work with every day because it's a great place to work. Um, and I'd like to thank Philips for uh, sponsoring uh, this whole event, and um, I hope everyone finds it useful. Uh, goodbye from uh, me in sunny Dorset. Enjoy the evening. Bye.